What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final, final little pass is a business. Dead Meat. Hey, welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're boyfriend and girlfriend, and we like to get scared together. Yeah. And we have an awesome guest today to talk about the films of John Carpenter, Chauncey K. Robinson. Hey, y'all. It's Chauncey K. Robinson. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got the name right. Yes. yes. Chauncey what? is another horror YouTuber. Yes. Mm-hmm. Go by the Twisted Girl Next Door. Occasionally, because nice. I like to watch horror with a smile. Yeah. <laughs> and Chauncey, I, I asked you to come on this episode because you wrote this really great article about They Live. And I just read that and was like, it'd be cool to have you on to just talk about all of John Carpenter's Yeah, movies, no, I'm excited. I think, <laughs> I think we've kind of gone through the same thing this week where it's a lot of movies to talk about. Because even if it's ones we've seen before... It's different watching them to get ready to analyze them. And we've been in like just John Carpenter land for a week. I have. Yeah. I have. Yes. <laughs> been a lot. But, you yeah. know, it was great. It was yeah. This will be our first episode uh, doing a deep dive on a single person. Yeah. That too. You're. This will be like a first for awesome. the podcast. Yeah. So you're kind of here to help us test out this like. Yeah, this type of episode. I'm going to just go ahead and give the heads up. My time was constricted by doing the double kill count this week, so I didn't get a chance to watch Mr. Carpenter's film. So my perspective here will be what I'm sure a lot of people listening maybe have. I've seen Mm -hmm. The Thing. I've seen Halloween. I kind of saw The Fog. And that's about it. I saw They Live. They Live. But yeah, I'll be coming from a perspective of like, oh, tell me more. That sounds interesting because The Thing is my favorite. And uh, I like John Carpenter as a person, from what I have read oh, about him. he's wonderful. He yeah, he's reminds awesome. me of my dad. He also reminds me of my dad. I he's think. everyone's dad. Yeah, <laughs> he is. He's very, uh, I think it's weird. A lot of those old horror masters, for some reason, just feel like such dads to me. I find them very comforting to listen to, like Romero's old interviews and stuff. And I always felt like Wes Craven was like my yeah. grandpa. Yeah. yeah. That's why I love him so much. I was like, oh. this guy's like my granddad. Know, They're all Craven. just so sweet and smart and nice to listen to. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, John Carpenter stuff. It's cool because he is so consistent. Like, and that makes sense because apparently he is a big proponent of auteur theory, Ooh. which is very controversial. Uh, if you're in like the film sphere, it wasn't taught to us as controversial in film school. It was, it was taught not. to us as fact. It was. Do you are you uh, familiar with not the that particular theory? term? You gotta tell me. Okay. okay. <laughs> so yeah, this is such film school bullshit. Um, <laughs> auteur, so auteur theory is the idea that the director is the most important part of the filmmaking process. So if you're a director, like I would say someone who fits in well to the idea of auteur theory is Wes Anderson. Absolutely. Um, wow, okay. Where We're you, like, when you watch one of his movies, you're like, this is that's a Wes, a Wes Anderson. So if someone showed you, hey, I'm going to put on a movie, and if you had no idea what it was, you could pretty easily guess that this is a Wes Anderson thing. Okay. So it's the idea that the director is always going to end up putting so much of themselves into the movie that like... It, they have like a voice that's consistent across all their films. Like mm-hmm. Hitchcock. Yeah. Spike Woody Lee, Allen. Maybe. Spike Lee Spike for Lee, sure. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Woody Allen. David Lynch. <laughs> yeah. Is, <laughs> I would say an auteur. But yeah. Oh, by the way, before we get too far into my notes, I want to give a shout out to this book. And normally I don't give shout outs to like specific books because I end up using a bunch of different sources. But this one kind of like um, Men, Women, and Chainsaws is like this is what we're using for this episode. It's uh, The Films of John Carpenter by John Kenneth Murr. Murr? M U I R. Um, really good like summary of Carpenter's career. So at the at the top, the first chapter, which is where I took like all my notes from, is an overall summary of his career. And then each chapter is one of his films. And so it goes into like that film for that chapter. Y'all, so there are so many underlines and notes in this book. Yeah, I ruined this book already. Chelsea's I like to ruin books. Chelsea's been a fucking mess this past week. <laughs> I feel just like in I'm this in... Carpenter hole. <laughs> yeah, just down the hole. Off the top, favorite Carpenter movies that, since you guys have seen so many now. I wrote it down because I wanted to make sure I got it out. The Mouth of Madness Hell is yeah. my top that's one. That's your number one? Yes. Yeah. Nice. That's my number one. Um, they Live. 
okay. is my second mm-hmm. just because of the politics and everything in yeah. it. Halloween, I actually do like the first Halloween. Awesome. It's great. Right? And The Fog. Okay. And nice. recently, the one I just watched this week for the first time was Prince of Darkness. Girl, I would, if I had time to watch it, I would have. it was so bizarre. And, you know, I didn't realize I loved it until it went off. Because halfway through, I was like, what is this? <laughs> and then afterwards, I was th- I was like, wow, this movie. Like, something about, like, the science of, like, the Antichrist and dark matter. I'm like, this was ahead of its time. I feel like this, this plot line was just too high. Who was in that one? Oh, I have it written down here somewhere. But it wasn't because Sam Neill Sam Neil, was. Isn't he, he in, in that one. Oh, he's not? Okay. He's not what in am that I thinking of? He was like in Mouth of Madness. Yeah, yeah, he's like the lead in that, which is great. Yeah, he was I, really great in that big one. Big double header recommend in the Mouth of Madness and um, Event Horizon. Okay. The, Best. They would go well. They I do them. like Event Sam Horizon, Neil too. Sam yeah. going crazy. Lawrence Fishburne is in that one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, did you watch the Memoirs of an Invisible Man? No, I didn't I watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I was saw the cover and or? I was like, what is it, Chevy Chase it's or something? Chevy Chase. And I was like, I'm good. I, I think he's fine. I just like I'm not saying that. Yeah. <laughs> like I gotta pick my I gotta pick with my time. So yeah, exactly. and I picked I want I went out of my way to see Prince of Darkness because it's part of what Carpenter calls his like apocalypse trilogy. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to see if I saw some type of theme between the between the three, like the thing. What, yeah. what are the three? Oh, the thing. The thing, um, Prince of Darkness, and the Mouth of Madness. Okay. The Mouth of Madness is a third in the trilogy. So, mm-hmm. did you? Did it feel like a trilogy at all to you? No, I. I mean, maybe I'm. Wrong, but I just I didn't feel like I got what he was saying, like the whole question of humanity and stuff. But mm-hmm. I didn't see. When I think of trilogy, I think of connecting stories. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. none of this Gentle connect. has the same yes. thing. He does. Yeah. And so does Boz Lerman has his Red Curtain trilogy. Yeah. Which those aren't connected at and all. And Polanski, but I think. Like the apartment trilogy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But with Argento, that connected because it was the three mothers, right? The yeah. three witches. So that yeah. was somewhat of a connection. So something. Okay. Yeah. So that had more connection. Yeah. Okay. God, I think the reason this sounds so all over the map already is because John Carpenter is a genre blender, if you watch his movies they as much as you can say okay yeah this one's a horror this one's more of a sci-fi he's still all of his movies are kind of picking from other things and he's just throwing them all in the same movie are halloween and the fog his only that are like straight strictly straight horror because even the thing is like sci-fi, sci-fi horror. Uh, i i think halloween's probably the most straight up yeah horror mm-hmm. um because even the fog well, I don't know how sci-fi it is, but it feels ghost less. Pirates. If it is ghost pirates, it feels less straight up horror than Halloween, because I think um, I have in my notes somewhere that it's a it's a town in trouble movie, yes. quote unquote, yeah. like The Blob or oh, yeah. The Birds, which mm-hmm. are horror movies, but there's you know they're not straight up like a slasher like Halloween <laughs> is. Um, well, Christine was sort of, well. That wasn't like I mean, oh, it was Stephen King, but it was oh yeah, somewhat of a kill. It was a killer car. I still, it's weird. I like <laughs> just watched it, and I still always forget that that's a John Carpenter. Yeah, movie. You, I think it's because it's more prevalent of the Stephen of a Stephen King. Yeah, book. yeah. Who so. also steps outside of the horror genre more than people think because mm-hmm. they I I think people forget that he wrote like Shawshank, Green yeah. Mile, mm-hmm. and Stand by Me, which mm-hmm. are not horror at all, but. They still have that Stephen King magical realism. Yeah. So people are uh, multifaceted. Yeah. But then as much as he is kind of mixing and matching and changing up what he's doing, he's still usually working with the same group of performers, artists, technicians over and over and over again. I guess even down to costume designers and gaffers. Mark Walther. He has a gaffer. That's awesome. That is consistent between films, which is wonderful. And I guess that he also, and this... It's so weird. He's like very, as much as he's a fan of the idea of the auteur, he still, I think, considers himself a studio director, which is like, it's harder to be an auteur when you're a studio guy. So I feel like there's already some conflict there. But he kind of refers to himself as like this big studio dude instead of a personal director. I guess this even went back to being in film school. It was something he struggled with because film school, you're getting, it's being emphasized like, no, make personal films, make intimate artistic films that are really personal to you. And John Carpenter shows up at film school and is like, but I want to make big Westerns and big budget movies that are crowd pleasers and not necessarily really personal or artsy or anything. That's so interesting because I never think of him like that. I don't. 
either. Mm. I guess now I do after watching all of these. I can see that and learning how they got made. But yeah, I never had that, you know, that thought either. Yeah, especially if like Halloween is your only John Carpenter exposure. It's like that's such like a, you know, bootstraps, just cobbled together movie. And yet he thinks of himself as like, what, like a would-be Spielberg? I guess more of a, um, I mean, his idols are all, like Howard Hawks is his, yeah. his, oh, okay. his guy. guy. Yeah, he loves Howard Hawks. Well, yeah, who did the original Thing adaptation. Yes, exactly. Which he, yeah, remade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even know he did. Like, I looked it up after I saw it, and I saw he did the original Scarface, and I was like, I like that oh, movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, like, I know, I want to watch more. I was like, that's awesome. Howard Hawks stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so John Carpenter's heroes, too, all are, like, these anti-authoritarian dudes, blue collar. Awesome. Yeah, they do what they want, kind of like John Carpenter mm. goes through life doing what he wants. He's making the movies he wants to make. That comes through, I think, especially in some of his later stuff. He's very um, anti-censorship. He's, you know, pro-religious freedom, anti-Reagan era greed which is when we start getting and they live and that's when we really start getting yeah they him is super political. it's very political it's him putting his beliefs on film and those tend to be pretty consistent film to film i guess even escape from new york is like the end of that he's very disillusioned with the president of the united states we did get you out a lot of people died in the process i just wondered how you felt about it well i <clears throat> I want to thank them. Uh, this nation appreciates their sacrifice. Uh, look, um, uh, I'm on the air in uh, two and a half minutes. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, even with the opening sequence with the um, the flight attendant slash terrorists, they you know they have this whole thing like the we're anti racist the establishment, the you know criminal justice system. I was like, whoa, this is like heavy. Like what they're trying. I mean, they're the terrorists in this particular, yeah. but like what they're going for in a, going against the government was pointed too. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, Maybe this is. It's kind of crazy that in that movie that character and like their terrorist organization is set up as the villains but then you kind of feel disillusioned the same way that snake does at the end where he talks to the president and the president is like so he like he could care he couldn't care less about the fact that so many people died while snake's trying to get him out of new york city and yeah. it's like very he just kind of is dismissive and, and the president is donald pleasance, donald pleasance which mm -hmm. is the best shit ever you that was different donald pleasance, <laughs> best president of the united states yeah the way you're describing this kind of sounds a little bit like black panther to me where like the the villain has oh, some ideas sure. where you're like yeah he's got some points you know, he's, got he's some not points. exactly wrong yeah. right yeah exactly and yeah the hero hero i'm mean, not snake the president the one you're supposed to, who's who's supposed to be the good guy like it's the president it's a film version of the president is at the end you realize oh he kind of sucks too <laughs> yeah. 1948 john carpenter's born so at this time hollywood is like big studio westerns and film noirs and suspense thrillers so that's kind of what little baby john carpenter is coming into the world <laughs> too is that kind of studio set up Apparently he, as a kid, knows he knows he wants to direct. He saw the African Queen in theaters and is just obsessed with it and becomes obsessed with movies. And he's super influenced by Westerns and sci-fi. And it's so obvious watching his movies that, yeah, those are like his two big loves. Like he knows those genres inside and out. He starts filming stuff at around age eight on 8mm film with nice. his friends, which... You know what? Most people I know who went to film school or like are interested in making film did that kind of stuff with their friends in the backyard. I was that kid. Like I asked my dad if I could have his old camcorder, which was huge. It was like I was it like a VHS one? No, it wasn't a VHS one. It had a t there was like a tape in it, but it still was big. It was like a big hefty boy. Did you ever yeah. make any home videos as a kid? Not home video. I mean, my I have a degree in theater, so I oh, okay. always like, was adapting something to stage yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Like I, for one of my projects, I did like Buffy the Musical as a yeah. stage production. Nice. <laughs> just like, did you yeah. have like backyard performances of things? No, my, mainly just like um, doing. <laughs> I did a lot of church plays. Oh, like, cool. <laughs> yeah, I love it. That's a good. I, I would I would like group that in with that kind of yeah stuff as a kid, where it's like going out of your way to do things that are genuinely difficult to do, yeah. you know? So he's making, like, 
like silly sci-fi stuff apparently i don't know how this author had the names of these films but uh <laughs> revenge of the colossal beasts terror from space and gorgon the space monster i would love to see those yeah <laughs> i hope that they exist somehow loves sci-fi and horror he loves 1950s pulp magazines like every other literally like every other horror director john carpenter's age so again the horror greats like wes craven um romero they all grew up reading these horror comics and yeah. again that's why i've said i want to do an episode on them lucy's coming to say hi to chauncey <laughs> <laughs> she might lay on top of your notes she does that my and cats do that too yep she's like but you're <laughs> when i'm writing them yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> they just want to help then he goes to usc where everyone goes to film school right, apparently yeah. seems like it. it's just <laughs> like it this kind of <laughs> blew my mind and fucked me up a little bit. 1969, he gets his first official screen credit. He's a co-writer, producer, editor, composer, and uncredited director, uh, co-director rather, of a 15-minute short called The Resurrection of Bronco Billy. And w it won the Academy Award for Best Short Subject in 1970. Oh, wow. And yeah. I bet they played it during the ceremony, not during the commercial, too. <laughs> yeah. So, um... I like I don't mean to make anyone feel like oh shit I should have some things accomplished by like, <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, because like, 21 wow. year old John Carpenter had an Oscar for best uh, live action short yeah. oh yeah technically he didn't get the Oscar it was, oh he didn't like, produce it he, he didn't did, produce he did it, everything yeah. but produce yeah oh no it he's says he no it. but he wasn't like the pretty like executive oh haha yeah. <laughs> well then I'm still better than him uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> but this is able I think later to help him get funding for shit and, sure yeah instead of working his way up the film career ladder which a lot of most people do i would say most people do you start off as a production assistant on set and work your way up and it sucks yes yeah, um <laughs> it sucks a lot <laughs> he just starts directing immediately which is also uh legitimate that's also what our uh what nicholas mccarthy said he did um mm -hmm. director of the prodigy which is out now go see it but we interviewed him uh not last week but the week before and he did that too he he said that he just immediately like he moved out here and started just making shit with his friends so that's a legitimate career path uh august 1970 carpenter meets up with his friend dan o'bannon who later would go to write the screenplay for alien which is oh, nuts nice yeah but friends from usc they want to make a low budget sci-fi movie that they see as a response to 2001 a space odyssey which is the most film student thing to do be like we're gonna make our response to <laughs> 2001 response. a space yeah, odyssey kind of need response. Yes. people need to hear what we have to say <laughs> yeah. about 2001 yeah i know right it's like writing a paper that's like on the subject of 2001 a space odyssey and it's like you're a little yeah this movie becomes dark star which did is, you watch Dark Star? I didn't watch Dark Star. I do know there's a beach ball. Yes, yeah. there is. Or something. Chelsea showed and I was me like, the oh. beach ball. It looks okay. bad. It's it a looks beach bad. ball with feet. Yeah. 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 yeah, so Dark Star is a sci-fi, and it does look like 2001 in parts. I mean, you can't mimic the look of that movie. It's insane. <laughs> Unless you build a giant like Ferris wheel set and have your actors run around in oh, it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that big rotating yeah. thing. Um, crazy movie. But it's it's that seventies sci fi look, which I I love the look of Dark Star. I think it looks cool. But it's these four slacker astronauts who I think are basically space truckers more accurately, like which alien. is kind of yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's like alien and they're trapped on this doomed, tedious mission. It's basically them living out like their last days or oh. but it's also a comedy. Yeah. We have Dan O'Bannon playing like the main character, Sergeant Pinback. So it's like <sighs> Chelsea did not enjoy it. I didn't love no. Dark Star I'm gonna, guys. I'm just gonna say as someone who's in the room, uh, <laughs> over the course of the three days it took her to watch this one. It movie, took me three because I kept I just kept <laughs> pausing it to go do yeah. other stuff. Not a good sign. Because <sighs> it's you can tell it started as a student film. Because what happens is they they film it and they complete it and it's only fifty minutes long and they're <laughs> like shit, because that's too long to be a short and it's too short to be a feature. So then they get another investor to give them $10,000 and they shot a bunch of additional footage. And it's the additional footage <laughs> that I could not get through. It was it's so weird how I could tell before doing any research about Dark Star that this boring ass stretch in the middle was like something. It just felt so 
pad it, it, it feels very padded mm. that's all the stuff with the alien they like have this weird little alien that i did laugh the one guy's like no i wanted a mascot for the ship may i remind you sergeant pinback that it was your idea in the first place to bring the alien on board if i may quote you you said the ship needed a mascot oh i have to do everything so they have this alien that's a beach ball. Yeah, of just feet. Google Dark Star Alien and look at the images. It's <laughs> it's literally ridiculous. a beach ball with the seams on the side and everything. It's <laughs> <laughs> but it's just this beach ball alien running around and it's a whole like man, I don't know. I couldn't. Do people die in Dark Star? Oh, everyone yeah. dies. Yeah. Oh. Everyone much. dies. Potential kill count. Yeah. <laughs> the I mean, that whole sequence is fun. They're all getting blown up and like shot into space and stuff, and those effects are kind of fun. Oh. Isn't there like a last surf scene? Yes. Or something? Okay, I did love the ending of this. <laughs> so the yes, thank you. The one character, like back on Earth, loved surfing and that was his whole thing. And he just misses surfing so much. And so the end, he's the last one alive and he grabs like a piece of the ship and just like surfs into the atmosphere of this planet and burns up. It's pretty yes, cool. Yes, he becomes a falling star. Tell me, looks like I'm headed for the planet. I'm going right toward it. When you hit the atmosphere, you'll start to burn. What a beautiful way to die. Oh, yeah. like in Jason X. It's pretty. <laughs> Which is an awesome movie. J yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. Jason X. Oh my God. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Remind me before you go, I'll give you one of our pins. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I would love that. You can buy those on timmystore.com, by the way. But yeah. <laughs> um, it's Jason in a NASA portrait holding a little helmet. <laughs> that is so cute. <laughs> <laughs> so another entrepreneur buys the rights and that just wants more money and they shoot more <laughs> pickup footage. This movie's oh, a wow. hot mess. Oh, yeah. Man. But it gets really good reviews. It gets a good review in Time Magazine of all places. I think Roger Ebert liked it, right? Yeah. <laughs> like it's generally liked. I just didn't like it <laughs> but this doesn't really jumpstart his career it's also not a super no, accessible movie no <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does yeah. not oh, the beach ball uh, space comedy yeah. didn't jumpstart his career so he makes his living for a bit writing stuff he writes eyes of lore mars which gets made in 1978 um a western called blood river and black moon rising which ended up getting made in 1985 with tommy lee jones and this is when he also writes escape from new york which gets filmed in 1981. But yeah, like we were saying before we were recording, it f feels older. Like it feels to me like a 70s movie. And that's because he's writing it basically as a reaction to all the Death Wish hoopla going on. Have you seen, like, are you familiar with Death Wish at all? No. Like I, I, They just remade it. Yeah. This is the story of a man who decided to clean up the most violent town in the world. No, Death Wish, I think, has it's some like, Issues. It's vigilante shit. It's Charles Bronson basically just killing. It, it's revenge. Death Wish is huge. Like, I mean, it has a bajillion sequels. Yeah, and people got, told me to cover it, and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, whatever. <laughs> um, so it gets, they remade it. I, yeah, I think it was Marky Mark. I'm not sure. Um, but so, cool. yeah. So then at this time, an investor takes a chance to, the, he, he gets a ton of money from an investor to make an exploitation film, and he basically tells him, Go make whatever you want. So an exploitation film, it's kind of like a weird thing to define. Basically, um, like I think a good example of an exploitation film is Friday the 13th. It's, oh, yeah? Yes. Like hmm. like a, like taking a very specific like motif and making that into a movie is what makes something an exploitation movie. So Aww. like the, the slasher genre is a genre of exploitation as well as a genre of horror. Oh. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I've never thought of the. I've always, you know, heard of, of course, like black exploitation yeah, mm -hmm. black films. Exploitation, and I always yeah. thought it was just because it was like, you know, someone was saying like jive turkey or something. <laughs> yeah. and so I was like, okay, that's kind of like overt stereotype. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're like playing that up, but there's still like a plot line. Because sometimes I think exploitation films get a bad rap. So with this budget and basically free reign to do whatever, he makes Assault on Precinct 13. Did you watch this one? No, 13? I didn't. Okay. I, I liked it a lot. Yeah, it's Charles pretty said good. I really liked it. But I, I also... saw the remake when it came out which i heard i don't i don't remember the Lawrence remake Fishburne. but i heard that it's good yeah okay yeah um so already he's starting to begin his roster of people that he's going to consistently work with because this has charles cyphers who's in like everything he's the uh sheriff in halloween sheriff bracket yes darwin Justin, who shows up in the fog and nancy loomis who shows up in halloween. she's in halloween mm -hmm. she was uh yeah it's funny her last name is loomis yeah we, yeah. it was just like a weird yeah. coincidence because she's annie right 
Yeah. In Halloween. And then so she's Tom Atkins's ex wife in Halloween three. Yeah, she is. That was weird. Cause I was like, is she like it didn't cause I think they grayed her hair. Like, yeah. That wasn't her uh, real gray. I was just like, you're too young still to be like yeah. <laughs> But it's Tom Atkins. Every woman that acts opposite him is too young. I know. <laughs> That's a thing. And then we have Austin Stoker, who isn't a carpenter regular, but he's just fucking great in this. So he's like the the sheriff, the league. And cop. Assault on Precinct thirteen is just a quick plot what is it so it's a it's a police station that um they're like moving out and they're moving buildings so you have this basically empty police station that this guy um austin soaker's character is in charge of looking over and they basically get attacked through like a bunch of circumstances that it would take me too long to kind of explain but this gang attacks the police station and essentially it's think of movies about the alamo it's that it's like a western style shootout oh, okay. of this police station but basically kind of home invasion oh little no less so oh, no okay. no it feels very much like holding down the fort and defending yeah it feels like defending the alamo kind yeah. of yeah because basically and it he purposely wrote it like this it's um instead of a cowboys and indians genre movie it's cops and gangs and the police station is yeah Oh, okay. Their fort. Cool. It's fun. I I liked it a lot. Also, really unexpectedly violent um, kid death in that movie, which yeah, like fucked my shit up. That's what I read up. about, and oh I was my- like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there's some stuff where I I do. I'm one of those people. I see if there's trigger stuff in things, and yeah. I'm like, I'm gonna avoid this. Yeah. It's, yeah. So you know, heads up. And that's near the beginning, so that's not a spoiler. That's an insight. And it's not, it's not a fun kid death. <laughs> Oh no, it's not. It's hey, fun Halloween, kid death. Halloween three has great fun kid death. Kid wearing the Halloween mask, his head yeah, in the Yeah, I know. I I didn't. I okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> Look, I just like when a movie has the balls to do it. What are you saying? You know, it's one of our great taboos on screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also this movie also is kind of a love story in a weird way because it's the Lee. You have, We're still talking about assault on priest. Yes, <laughs> because the cop. It's the relationship between you have the the black cop and the white convict who team up to like save the station and everyone in there. And their dialogue is almost flirtatious at times. You saved my life twice now. Twice. First time outside by the bus. I figured that was a mistake on your part, so. I let it go. Are they a couple of bros or are they, is one of them a lady? What? No, it's a both two ma- dudes. Yeah, both okay. men. Wait, yeah. ladies oh, can no, be no. convicts No, 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 I was officers. just confused. There is a, la- there is a lady, um, Lori Zimmer, playing the, um, uh, she like works at the police station, but she's also kind of a Howard Hawks, like, um, like, She's really smart and kind of talks like she's kind of quippy and Catherine Hepburn. A little bit as good as she gets. Yep, yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh, MPAA wants that scene with the girl getting killed cut out, which he cuts out in the version he sends to them, but sends the uncut version to theaters. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought that was a boss move. I was <laughs> like, wow, man, that is just like take your balls, like put them on the table. Kind of like, look, move. holy shit, that wow. was awesome. Yeah. Apparently, speaking of black exploitation, this was marketed in America as a yeah, black exploitation, which, which makes was- no sense. <laughs> when I read that, I was just like, oh, that's interesting to me because the black person is like one of the main He's characters. He's a character. And that's a thing. Therefore, it's a black And it's prison, film. I guess. Maybe a black person and it's prison. Yeah. That's a thing. It's, but it's not <laughs> like at all. Europe loves it. Europe loves this oh, movie. Okay. And so this kind of gives him his like, he gets a little, um, yeah. A little uh, clout? Legit, yeah, clout. That's the word I was looking for. He apparently was approached to direct the Star Trek movie, um, which I think is supposed to be like a good choice that he turned it down. I haven't seen it, but that's supposed to be bad. I don't the really first know. first one? Yeah. Some of them are well rig- I don't know my Star Trek at all. I don't either. I was a warzy. I do not either. Um, so he's not really getting picked up by major studios, but then 1978 happens, and this is the probably the biggest year of his career. He gets picked up by Erwin Yablins. Am I pronouncing that right? Yep. Um, who is a producer for Compass International Limited, who has an idea for a new exploitation picture about a guy <laughs> murdering a bunch of babysitters. Yep, it was Erwin Yablins who had the like idea. Yeah, that. and he's not excited about that idea um, until they get around to deciding to set it on Halloween night. So he agrees to write it with Deborah Hill. Donald Pleasance joins. You the- don't know what death is. <laughs> get your ass out of here. <laughs> Isn't that what like the kids like? Yeah, like Lonnie, <laughs> yeah, Lonnie. right? Um, really great Donald Pleasance. Maybe my favorite Donald Pleasance line in Escape from New York when he's shooting Isaac Hayes at the end, and he's like, "You're a number one." Yeah, a number one. Yeah, a 
fucking <laughs> loading him up with bullets. Donald Pleasance is so great. Uh, yeah, I guess his daughters were big fans of Assault on Precinct 13, so he takes the role after Christopher Lee turns it down. Yeah. I didn't yeah. Lee yeah. Wow. wow. That would have been a different... And right? I believe, it would have been a different vibe. I believe I he said later that he regretted turning it down, Christopher mm. Lee did, which... Christopher Lee, man. I didn't know that lost. he... Our friend pointed this out, that he voiced... A character in Kingdom Hearts, which is the funniest yeah, shit. Yeah, because he a hundred percent in life. He did. He hunted, he did a speed like he just yeah, not a speed run. He died when he was like ninety something. Yeah. But you know he yeah. did a run of life where you do all the side quests and get <laughs> yeah. every get all the trophies. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis's cast, obviously. It's Janet Lee's daughter. So it's all getting tied back around to Hitchcock. They even went into writing this as like, we're going to make a Hitchcock-style horror movie. This is when Dean Cundy, am I pronouncing that right? Okay. He joins the cinematographer, which is really important because Dean Cundy ends up filming like almost everything for him. And that's a carpenter look. So when it came out, people didn't like it. But then it gets a really good review in the village voice. And then that's when we see the tide start to shift and... Roger Ebert's giving it four stars and everyone mm-hmm. loves it. It becomes a cult movie. I guess they pulled it out of theaters abruptly so that they could re-release it the next year and in that time Ooh. generate word of mouth. Yeah, supply and demand. Yeah, and nice. I guess that's Capitalism. That, yep. Not a bad <laughs> yeah. Um, funnily enough, we were wondering if this was true in our episode with Joey Clift. Uh, if Halloween becomes the most profitable independent film in history until... 1990 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles That threw me off when I read your note. I was like, wait a minute. I know. First of all, I didn't even know Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was independent. I thought that was like a stupid... I'm like, who does that as an independent... Like indie (laughs) film. But also, how was Star Wars not? Because Star Wars is an independent film, technically. I don't know. Mm. All right. I mean, are we taking into account the amount of money they had to spend on Star Wars? Because I think that's why... It is expensive to have a Star Wars. But also, how is... The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie not expensive. Yeah, that's yeah. why I was really confused. I was like, I didn't know that. I I thought a big studio was behind that yeah. because you know you have like merchandise and things. Like, you're yeah. thinking you're gonna make yeah. toys. Exactly. I was just like, okay, there's a lot going on in that sentence. Yeah. <laughs> So critics start comparing Carpenter to Hitchcock, which he doesn't love as much as he wants. He wanted Halloween to be a Hitchcock style movie. He says, critics compare me to Hitchcock, but I know that's bullshit. If I start taking myself seriously, that's bullshit too. I'm just down to make a good film. I try my best with each one and then go on to the next one. And so he's always been a grumpy old man. Always. Yeah. And he consistently, that's his mantra up until like the films he's most, re- his, he just does what he wants and people get frustrated with him over it, especially later, like as he's making, um, I think after he makes the thing and after he does Christine, like that era is when critics are like, he should be beyond horror movies by now, which really pisses him off. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. They're all like, he should be working on more, um, like, legitimate. Which is so disrespectful to horror. I know. Because it's like, it's what bullshit. are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it is curious. That makes me, because, like, like we said at the top, he considered himself, like, a big crowd-pleasing. But he, I don't think the the returns are there to support the idea that he was successful in that regard. That's why he says later, um, I think I have a quote from an interview, he he thinks he would have been happiest in like the 40s and 50s because then he could really like double down and make genre stuff. Like Western and, and that's ours, when that yeah. stuff does well. Mm-hmm. Not so much, you know. I, yeah, because I think, I, I think, and I might have this figure wrong, but I saw that like all of his movies together only have made like, 20 million dollars maybe which i mean yeah it, it, the money's different because of inflation but comparing that to just like a single blockbuster mm-hmm. hit nowadays like, yeah. i mean we have billion dollar movies now it's just crazy how like yeah and i wonder how many people in the general public who aren't into horror know john carpenter right like would someone our age who's not into horror know john carpenter maybe not maybe besides not. like halloween you yeah. know mm-hmm. and and it sucks that like he wanted to be this big big time director and it's like it i don't think it panned out yeah. even though he made a bunch of really good movies right right uh so he meets adrian barbo on uh this like tv movie someone's watching me they get married and form their own production company 
then he makes the fog in 19 oh my god i don't have the year of the fog i think it's like 79 the year yeah. of oh, no yeah. opens in 1980 so the year of the fog that's uh next year's year chinese fog. new year yeah 1980 yes. <laughs> it's 1980, 1980. Mm-hmm. and uh yeah lots of john carpenter people we're just gonna start to see a pattern where i'm naming all the same john carpenter people over and over and over again and this is when I never thought about this with John Carpenter, but I think it's interesting. This is when we start getting his signature of faceless evil, even though Michael Myers is a person. The goal was to have just a blank. He's, yeah, boogeyman. he's the yeah. shape. The shape. Yeah, he's yeah. not supposed to have a person. Like he's not like he's effectively not a person. But uh, I thought that a satanic cult gave him his power no. <laughs> to kill his family. Oh. Yeah. Yes. But no, I, I thought that he was raised in like a white trash home uh, and got uh, man. Anyway, I have so much issues like with the movies. canon of Michael Myers. Yeah. Yeah. That. But originally he was just a guy. Yes. And then you have the fog, which is fog. And even then the the ghost pirates in the fog, you don't really get a good look at them and they're kind of we learn like their name and st- like the guy's name is like Blake something where, but they have a backstory, but they're still like, they're kind of mysterious and a bit. Yeah. It's like this faceless, same with the thing is a mm-hmm. faceless evil. And he, yeah, that's like a thing of his that kind of reappears in film to film often as horror films is like the idea of an ambiguous faceless personality less evil it's just evil being a force which i think is really really interesting i think you mentioned something about it being a tr- you said in your notes a, a tribute to ec comics yeah. which i thought was awesome because ec comics the whole thing with their censorship mm-hmm. issue that they had to deal with mm-hmm. and then it was just like them also being a very progressive like thing with race equality and things like that i'm like i know i like this guy like he you know <laughs> <laughs> like has a uh, throwbacks to something that has such a great history yeah and made the mad you know magazine so yeah 1980 the fog opens great reviews makes a bunch of money however the fog starts to become the subject of a lot of second guessing we see this happen all the time a movie comes out and everyone loves it and then it starts getting reappraised. Uh, after the fog, he makes Escape from New York, which, yeah, he wrote earlier in the 70s, but now he gets to make it. And it's like this huge budget. It's his like, biggest budget yet. And he is able now to kind of use his his reputation with the studios and his clout to cast Kurt Russell. Because Kurt Russell was like a, t- a teen Disney star, which I always forget about him. He was in like Disney movies. Yeah. And I didn't shit. know that, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I forget to, oh man, I forgot to fact check this, but a Urban pl- Legend, Walt Disney's last words were Kurt Russell. Yeah, like on his deathbed. On he's his a, deathbed. Kurt, Kurt Russell, Russell. And then he died. What? Yeah. It's, I, I forget <laughs> if it's true or not. Yeah, I forgot to fact check that, but it's like one of my favorite urban legends of all time. That is. Uh, weird <laughs> yep so because the studio wants him to cast charles bronson who was in death wish which is the most studio bullshit decision ever to be like oh we want to make death wish write something that's the same and then we'll cast charles bronson also like come on or they want to feel like Eastwood. that's most liam neeson movies now yeah well not mm. not anymore <laughs> <laughs> not anymore <laughs> Oops. Yeah, that guy yeah <laughs> why'd you say that liam no no one you asked. can't watch it taken again oh it's the same God. kind of right like no one asked you <laughs> like what <laughs> it's like how what do you think about your new movie come out i wanted to kill black men <laughs> like, back oh, in the God. day like uh, okay yeah With the movie. <laughs> oh, jesus christ <laughs> Okay. <sighs> so, <laughs> but Carpenter insists on Kurt Russell. And then after this, Kurt Russell becomes a huge action star. After this in Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah. And they have a kind of Howard Hawk, John Wayne relationship, which is interesting. Oh, nice. Yeah. Look, kind he's of becoming all of his. Uh, he's his doing heroes. it. He's yeah. doing it. Yeah. Yep. Donald Pleasant's returning, playing against type, apparently <laughs> described as, quote, the unholy union of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, unquote. Ah. Mm. It's very good, James. Yeah, you really like this. And so I've, I've never seen Escape from New York. My impression of it, because that's, uh, he's Snake in yeah. that one, right? Which is the basis for Solid Snake. Solid Snake, <laughs> yeah. who I will occasionally fight as in Smash Bros., but from the Metal Gear Solid mo- uh, games. And it, my impression of this movie, Escape from New York, and I guess the sequel, is that it's just like cheesy action movie. But you hate cheesy action movie, and you I love do. this movie. It's- 
Yeah, I'm not a huge action movie fan. Ones I do like are... It, it reminded me of watching Die Hard for the Die first Hard. time yeah. where... Yeah, it does have... Yeah. Yeah, where it wasn't what I was expecting it to be, even though it's like one of the most famous action movies of all time. It still had substance and I was still really interested in the story. That's the issue I have with action movies is I just am bored, mm-hmm. you know. But this has an interesting enough story to keep you well, in I'm it. Well, I'm very interested in it. And it is like... It just looks gross, and I love it. It's still, <laughs> even though this is an early Well, it 80s, looks like New York. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, like that, that <laughs> That's York, true, yeah. Like and now, and no, I love sorry. It. I'm a Jersey person, so I have issues <laughs> in New York. We have a, we have a rivalry. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. It's like us in Ohio. Yeah. The Statue of Liberty is in our part, y'all. It's in- <laughs> Wait, <laughs> what? But they always claim it. Like, come to New York to see the Statue of Liberty, but it's in the Hudson. That's New Jersey. Oh. That's is New Jersey, right? Oh, it is. Look, you know what? <laughs> it's okay. That's our. That's like their Toledo strip. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. Dean Cundey back as the cinematographer, and yeah, this this movie's grimy looking. I think that's why I like it too. Is mm. I I think once we start getting into eighties, early nineties, everything is a little glossier looking, and I don't love it as much. It's this has like the late seventies grime all over it. I don't know why everything in the seventies for some reason looks like it has a film of dirt on it, but I love, <laughs> love it. it. I love it. It's so gross. Um, I think it's so funny that watching this and watching Ernest Borgnine in this, who is like famous character actor Ernest Borgnine, and the big budget of this allows them to cast him. It's nuts that he was a reoccurring character on SpongeBob for like years, and it's so As, uh, Mermaid Man. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So it just kind of blows my mind that we got to like have that <laughs> as a culture. <laughs> and then, oh yeah, on the crew, an unknown matte painter by the name of James Cameron. Oh wow! Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I was like, whoa, yeah. that's crazy. He I painted, didn't know that he had. Uh, he was a matte painter. Yeah, he painted a decrepit Central Park for this. I did not know he was a matte painter either. Movie's a big hit, so he's he's like pretty consistently turning out, fin- you know, financially and critically some hits. And then we get Halloween 2, which he says this ends up being more of a business thing than creative. Well, my yeah, what I yeah, learned here, in my research t- was yes. that he wrote it with a six pack. Like he would like every <laughs> oh, night, like he, he did not want to write this movie. He did not want to make a, a sequel. He didn't direct it. No. But he, he wrote the script, co-wrote it with Deborah Hill again. And like he, he says that like every night he just drank a six pack and wrote what he could That's... because it was so difficult for him to write it <laughs> yeah the director of it rick rosenthal mm-hmm. he goes on to direct a bunch of tv but also directs the... halloween resurrection with buster rhymes oh what? yep he came back to do that one <laughs> okay but, but he also... also did the birds to <gasps> land's end, end as oh. alan smithy yes oh. do you know the alan smithy no. thing alan smithy is a generic name that if like a director is so ashamed of the movie they made, they used it as a pseudonym. So Alan Smithy what? has oh. directed tons of, movies, of movies and they're all really bad ones because the director didn't want their name on it. Wow. So the yeah. guy who made the Halloween with Buster Rhymes, whose name was attached to that movie, <laughs> was so ashamed of Birds 2, he he took his name that off is, of it. Wow, with, with, the, with the standard set by the fact that he had his name attached to the Buster Rhymes Halloween, right? that's yeah. like, oh, damn, yeah. Birds 2 must be really bad. <laughs> yeah. So this next, the next movie that John Carpenter does kind of changes his career path based on the... How intense it was to make, and then ultimately the reception that it gets. Mm. Yeah, so I, you know what we're talking about, The Thing. The best horror yeah. movie ever made. So he goes to remake, this is Howard Hawks' movie, it's his hero. He goes to remake um, uh, The Thing from Another World, right? Is that, yeah, Thing yep. from Another World. Um, I forgot if it was World or Planet. But he, instead of remaking the film, decides to remake the short story. That's he adapts right. the short story that this is based on, yeah. which I think was a good call. And his version is way closer to the short story than the original movie. Yeah, the monster. Mm-hmm. Is, yeah, yeah, the like monster assuming identities and. It's more of like a humanoid figure in the original, right? I've never yes. seen that fifties one. In the fifty one, it's like a plant like creature oh. type thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's, he brings on Rob Botton, who's twenty two, to do effects for this. I think it might be Botin, which is weird because it's two T's. But yeah, Rob Botin, yeah amazing effects oh and yeah I didn't, yeah that's right he was only 22, 22 rocking out those effects that makes it 
so difficult to watch that Chauncey, Chauncey hasn't watched. Yeah, I was just about to confess that because yeah. <laughs> I can't sit through that with movie. the dogs. Is oh that, that's my what gosh! Stops you is when you get I was. The dogs? I told myself I was like, I'm going to watch it this week. I'm going to get through this movie. And then I just had flashes of the dog scene and flashes of when he like is yeah. doing this thing. The defibrillator and, yeah. and it eats his hand. Yeah, I was like, I was. I literally did. I just like convulsed. I was oh, like, I, I can't that. do that's, this movie. That for I like can't. That for many people is like a ringing endorsement of the film. Oh my gosh, I can't. I have my limits. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that was so one much. of them. Yeah. So if you, yeah, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's like the one film that Chauncey was like, nope, can't. So there I, you go. I just cannot. The detached head. I was I was like, what oh, is yeah. this? Oh, man. <laughs> but it's, it, it sounds like it was a crazy shoot. 14 hour days, seven days a week. Uh, Out there in BC, 30, yeah. Yeah, 35 artists and technicians working on effects. The fi- the things they did film in Southern California, like at Universal um, mm-hmm. and stages, they kept the sound stages at 40 degrees so that every- you could see all the actors' uh-huh. breath. Like, fuck, it sounds fucking miserable. Um, yeah. But they're all like, man, this thing's going to be awesome because everyone is like putting their best work into this thing. I think everyone involved is super proud of it. Everyone, <laughs> yes. That's what it seems like is everyone who worked on this is like, I did the best work of my career. <laughs> yeah. But then it it tanks. But also it releases up against E.T., Wrath of Khan, uh, Star Trek, Wrath of Khan, Poltergeist, and Blade Runner. Oh, <laughs> That's no. fucking tough. That's a lot of competition. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of like sci-fi competition there too. Yes. E.T., Blade Runner, even Poltergeist kind of. Oh, and obviously Star Trek. Yeah. And oh, it's his no. first bomb. It's his first box no. office bomb. And critics hate it. And they trash it as like a pointlessly gory film. Fuckers. He says he was called a, quote, pornographer of violence. Ah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't go that far. With <laughs> no. I oh. wouldn't say that. I mean, it was, it was gross to me but yeah. it wasn't like you know you have films that don't even have those kind of special effects but they're literally you're just watching someone be brutalized that wasn't how yeah. this movie was at all yeah i would I think know. it was more so the whole idea of like what do you call it nihilism or right? like you know like mm-hmm. this idea of something being it was kind of depressing like right hopeless? like there's yeah. it's hopeless and you know you just had et yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 i want to watch that, that. <laughs> we have happy aliens <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> But as the years go on, people start to defend it, obviously, and it becomes like a really important sci-fi movie. And uh, yeah, John Carpenter says it's his best film. So. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, oh, boy. Carpenter and Hill revisit Halloween again, and <laughs> they decide, let's make it an anthology. Let's revisit other kinds of stories happening on Halloween. They get Nigel Neal to write Halloween 3, who wrote Quarter Mass, which I'd heard of. It's like a sci-fi British mm. show, um, slash, I think there's films, too. But So they just produced. Carpenter and Hill yeah, just that produced point, Halloween 3, and he composed the music for it, I yes. believe. Yes. Which is a very good soundtrack. But um, So Nigel Neal writes this crazy-ass script, and the <laughs> studio has hates it because they're like it's too different from the first two make it more simple more gore so then that's what happens and Tom Nigel Neal leaves and it, it, it basically just all kind of starts to fall apart um it's a big big failure uh Dean Cundy still shoots it so it still looks like the first two but mm-hmm. yeah big failure everyone like fans miss the OG cast critics hate it um, th- I like it. I love it. I love yeah. Halloween three. I think it's great. I think now it's having a bit of a. It does have a bit of a resurgence. Yeah, now. but um, you you said you just watched it or rewatched. Yeah, it Yeah, I rewatched it, and, and like, I thought you it was a big fan. No, I mean I thought it was um solid for mm-hmm. it, but I guess maybe also because. I was probably one of those people where I was just like, oh, so this isn't Michael Myers in mm. this one. And it's, I mean, I think the whole anthology idea is, was it probably ahead of its time in a way to kind of have this series and then be like, we want to switch the story, but it's still Halloween. I thought that was a great concept, but I don't know. I, it kind of like, it was a little slow for me. It is a little slow. The, to, mm-hmm. to get started. And mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. And it's weird to do the anthology on the third one. If they had done it with the yeah. second one, maybe it would have been Yeah, different. that would have made have... sense because people would have been ready for it. Yeah. Like, okay, that was the end of Michael Myers. Here's a new one for mm-hmm. Halloween. Yeah, That would have been cool, but I'm a big fan. Yeah, but this is when he says goodbye to the Halloween series for good until this new one. Yeah, not until 2018. Yeah. Like, literally. This is when he kind of starts to reassess his career and does a project that he totally admits and is public about the fact that he did this one for money. Uh, he does. He does. Christine, the adaptation of the Stephen King novel. Fun fact: They destroyed 23 1958 yeah. Furies for this film, and I wrote paging Joe Bob Briggs because Joe <laughs> Bob Briggs does not like when cars get destroyed for films, especially <laughs> classic. 
like collector's cars. Wow. And I felt that watching it. I, I had that exact thought too. I was like, how many cars did they totally root? Because they're nice looking cars, dude. I have not seen this one. Chauncey, did you watch? Uh, I did. Christine? I watched okay. Christine. I think I saw it when I was younger. I have this thing with my childhood where I'm just like, I've seen this movie before, but then you just like, once you watch it again, I'm like, oh, I did watch this, but I didn't remember it that way. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I thought it was solid. I, you can, I mean, it was one of those things where I know he switched a lot from like the, the King novel um, to make it more of a succinct because that King novel was all over it's the place. Also. Uh, yeah. I bought it and I'm like, <laughs> I, it came in the mail and I was like, Oh, I can't. Oh, <laughs> yeah. this is about a car? No, it's a lot of side stories. That's the issue. Yeah. So it's like, so they condensed it. I liked it. I thought it was creepy enough. It was a, a I don't want to say like cute creepy, but it was like a cute creepy movie. This guy gets obsessed with his car who's maybe a woman. He didn't speak to press at all making this because of the bad experience during the thing. It opens to good reviews, moderate success, but he thinks it's his worst film. He, oh. He's like, it's not wow. scary and it's my worst film. Yeah. Even over Dark Star. All right. <laughs> I think he's proud of Dark Star. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine him being sure, proud yeah. of yeah. Dark Star. Uh, in 1984, he directs a large budget sci fi, which I won't talk about too much because it's not a horror, but I really liked it. Starman. Apparently. Is he waiting in the sky? Yeah. Oh. I was surprised. When did that song come out? Way before this. Okay. Yeah. I'm surprised it wasn't in that. Um, Columbia, I guess, turned down E.T. to make Starman instead, but then E.T. comes out and they're like, fuck because <laughs> it's very similar so they just totally they bury this one after et comes out but starman is about like a benevolent alien right yeah is he trying to help people yeah that's the fucking song oh i know i that's why i was surprised the song's not in the it song was 72 73 like he's afraid he'll blow our minds it's yeah. like star I, I know how is I hope it's the very Bowie weird. State sued someone. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael Douglas and I had to Google to check that it was in fact like the Michael Douglas, and it was uh, determined is determined to make it. He's like a producer, and so he goes. Oh. Yeah, they go through a bunch of writers and directors. Finally, John Carpenter comes on board. Um, there's like a bunch of bullshit with the script where the guy who wrote the draft they shot didn't get credit by the WGA mm. politics. So then it's like four Dean Reisner in the credits because he actually wrote it, even though he couldn't get credit for it. It's oh, his wow. biggest. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> this is his biggest budget yet. You showed me a clip of this. It's weird seeing Jeff Bridges that young. It's dude. so mm. weird. Yeah. Je- I just like, know him as the dude. Yeah, Jeff Bridges to me seems like someone who's just perpetually like an older, older. Like sixty. It's very yeah. weird seeing him young. Um, but a lot of people think this is his most human movie because it's really intimate and it's very very good i liked it a lot of carpenter fans were not into it though because it was not a horror movie it's very different from everything he's done up to this point shall i tell you what i find beautiful about you you are at your very best when things are worst I guess- oh and who was in the clip you showed me Oh, Ted White. Yeah, Ted White, Jason from part four. Oh. Excuse me, miss. You strike me as a meteor. I could fix you up with a nice haunch of venison. Very nice gentleman who is 93 so now. He's wow. 93. He is fantastic. And yeah, he has a little, a little role in there. Yeah, he's like a deer hunter in this, and he's very funny. I saw that Starman was like one of his higher grossing ones, though. It said mm-hmm. like it was number two. So yeah. obviously. After Halloween, I think. Yeah. Right? It did yeah. really well to the point where I guess it got spun off into a season of TV that's supposed to be very bad. Oh. But it happened recently, too, right? What? Did they do it again? Oh, no. I'm thinking of Life on Mars, another oh. show that took a <laughs> title from a Bowie. So song. after this, now he's like, okay back you know I'm, I'm back on track i can maybe start to do a little bit more of what i want now you know i have a bit more freedoms now he wants to make a kung fu movie mm. <laughs> he, uh john i know it's <laughs> yeah yeah okay so he, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about it he so he uh was a big fan of mar- martial arts films and he wants to try directing his own and he to his credit recognizes like those movies and chinese cinema period is like so different from the way we make films, like style, how they're made, everything. So it's like you have to really respect that difference in order to make something that would fit into that genre. Um, so he gets the script for Big Trouble in Little China. So he casts Kurt Russell, which again is like Kurt Russell playing a, a John Wayne type character in like a pseudo Western thing where before he's maybe more Clint Eastwood and Escape from New York. This he's like basically John Wayne. Okay. He's got that swagger. But he's John Wayne if John Wayne is a total idiot. Because that's the point, I, I think, is like the point of uh, Big Trouble is 
Um, and before John Carpenter was brought on, this was not what the script was like. Kurt Russell in this is the sidekick. He's not technically not the main character, even though obviously all advertising is going to be Kurt Russell and stuff. Yeah. And you assume. Wait, did, you, did you see this one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess what happened was John Carpenter gets the script and is like, I don't want to make a movie where the sidekick is like the bumbling ethnic guy because that's yeah. every fucking movie. So he turns it around and all the lead cast is Asian. And then you have Kurt Russell, who's an idiot and is like <laughs> always falling over and like fucking things up. Which, like, I think is is interesting. I think, obviously, now, if anything like this gets made today, you're not having John Carpenter do it, you know? You're not having, like, a bunch of white writers do it. Um, but it's interesting how back then... <laughs> fingers when, crossed. Fingers yeah. crossed, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's interesting that back then, when he gets handed the script, he then also went back and, like, rewrote a bunch of it to uh, not be as racist. So yeah. thank you, John Carpenter. Although I'm wondering, how racist was it before they made this? You'd be surprised, right? It's just, like, how far they can go. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, yeah. he also insisted on doing the I mean he always insists on doing the music but this specifically he insisted on doing the music because he knew oh, he knew that just because this movie had this big Asian cast that all the music was going to be like ding, 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 oh ding, my ding. god yeah. so he's like yeah. no so it's got like a a synth like it's not that kind of bullshit you know it's like mm -hmm. a good it's a John Carpenter soundtrack I love so. that Kim Cattrall was in it she's like in yeah. one of my favorite movies Mannequin Oh, like, okay. that's like I one of my favorite mannequin, movies right? ever from like the early yeah 90s? where yeah. she's a mannequin yeah. and it's a love story too it's kind of like a supernatural thing I oh, okay yeah. i haven't seen it but like i i'm I it'd be a it. weird one for me to watch because i haven't seen it since i was a very little mm. kid but i remember yeah just being like oh shit yeah so um he brings in a bunch of uh martial arts experts from hong kong specifically jim lao kenny and and james blue thought i would shout them out in case anyone's like a martial arts fan huge budget Two million dollars just for special effects. Wow. Total, it's between twenty or twenty-five mil. I think like no one really knows <laughs> how much it actually was. Um also this film bumps. It just tanks. It, critics don't really like it. Um like it, it also was competing that weekend against Aliens, Oof. The Fly, and Labyrinth. Three Oof, films wow. I like better. Yeah. Yeah. Those you know? are three pretty <laughs> yeah. damn good. Those are movies. three no, very sense, good yeah. movies. Yeah, how do you guys feel about Big Trouble? So, I mean, it's action, you know. I, yeah. I remember funny. That's what I remember. I didn't hate it, but I remember, oh, this is funny. And there's a, an adventure going on. Yeah. <laughs> I I don't know. Like, for me, it's weird. The humor in it, for me, is the thing that made me, like, ugh, Oh, it made you cringe. Because it's very, <laughs> it's very 80s yeah. quippy, which I don't like. See, I love 80s quippy. Okay. <laughs> so if, you like, if you like that, you'll like Big Trouble in Little China, I think. But is, is Little China in, like, New York? San Francisco. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because here, here I'm going to admit, as someone who has not seen a lot of these, uh, this one and Escape from New York are like in my head is the same movie because they're it's Kurt so Russell different. Yeah, very different. They're okay. very different. They look completely different. The tone is it, like they're they're super different. But Good I see know. where yeah. I think it looks incredible. I think the production design is so good. Like the whole finale fight, there's it's definitely like Eastern inspired everything. But then you also have neon lights and shit. It's very weird and cool. I like it. I think the idea of them setting it present day is cool. It was supposed to be set at like um eighteen like old west. Mm. Um, which I can I absolutely can think of a version of that script that is super racist. <laughs> <laughs> like old west, like Yeah. Yeah. More like railroad work. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Exactly. I think he kind of has a, a a realization that he is actually happiest doing small films outside the system instead of trying to be a big studio guy. I think this is when he's like, no, I think I'm happier just being able to do what I want outside, even if I have a smaller budget. So he signs a four film deal in early 87 with a live films and they are like, do whatever you want. Interesting. So this is when he makes Prince of Darkness, which you said you really liked. Yeah, I liked it. I yeah. mean, halfway through, it was one of those movies where I was just like, oh, what is this after a bit? But then at the end of it, I was like, wow, this seemed like it might have been like just the storytelling. Because I know he wrote that, too. Like, I think he wrote. Yes, he wrote it under a pseudonym, Martin Quartermass, because it was an homage to Nigel Neal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, just the whole plot line was really interesting because we've had like antichrist, uh, anti God type stuff before, but they did it where it was like this whole thing of like dark matter, and there was like this dark matter 
entity substance that was also infecting people and it was just so weird but yeah. <laughs> just like this is weird but it was really good yeah it sounds like it's um yeah like typically the antichrist is a person yeah. but this it's like it's a something it's like yeah they the reason why i thought it was so weird because the first half of the movie it's like based off of these like not based but these grad students and they're like for a good chunk of the movie i knew the synopsis of the movie but the good big chunk of the movie they're talking about like um numbers they're doing math mm-hmm. and stuff and they're like having these like real like conversations about the reality and what's the real reality i'm like whoa <laughs> <laughs> i was like i thought this was about satan <laughs> yeah like, i'm sorry <laughs> like, what are we doing <laughs> the horror community likes this movie like it does well with horror fans critics hate it <laughs> um this is when they they, they all kind of start saying you should have evolved beyond this by now you shouldn't be doing horror anymore because you're better than this kind of bullshit i know was ebert among them probably (laughs) but also this is like the dark ages of horror too when is this This late 80s yeah late 80s this is after we get the first wave of good slashers and before scream it's just like a weird yeah Yeah, a lot of imitations i mean uh, it's not that there's not good stuff yeah because child's play candy man those. those two, yeah. <laughs> those two are like good late like 80s, just early those. 90s movies. Yeah, but it's just overall. That's when you're on your, your eighth Jason. And when yeah, did exactly. Wishmaster come out? That was like 90. Later than you would think. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it is later than you would okay. think. Okay. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's weird. It does not feel like a post scream. It, it feels like, yeah, pre scream, but I think it's right after. But yeah, Carpenter says, no, I'm doing what I want. Like, he just <laughs> says, fuck off to the press and does what he wants. And then he makes his most anti authoritarian film ever ever <laughs> they live yes yeah so this is his second film in the deal with a line where he's again allowed to just do whatever the fuck um he basically is just r- making this movie that is a message rallying against the greed is good mentality of the 80s and like the reagan era um it's great do you want to talk about it oh i just i loved it i mean i did an article about the with the anniversary of it coming up and it was just one of those th- i remembered it when i was younger but i didn't understand it as much i just remember that there were like blue flesh colored things like and the thing obey and then mm-hmm. like looking at it later i was like wow this is very relevant you know just this whole thing of Re- the reagan era and like trickle down e- economics and like the people who were working class people trying to find work, the unemployment that was going on. And I was just like, this is one of the most awesome films I've seen. (laughs) And like the main character, just like this everyday wanderer guy just trying to make sense of it. Like he's not some scientist somewhere who knows what's going on. It's just like he happens upon it. And there's like a big chunk of that movie where he's just shooting people up because he doesn't really know what to do, you know? And it's just like, yeah, that that's practical. That's what (laughs) might happen. You know, I really enjoy that movie. Yeah. Freaking rowdy Roddy Piper. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, that I I, yeah, thinking about it and thinking about the main character being kind of an every day dude is that's what all of us are rallying against these kinds of forces of greed and just the feeling of not being able to control that kind of you know the greed of other people and fighting against the system yeah you're just like a dude you know you're not like some scientist who knows the answer to all the problems or someone in the government who can work from the inside like realistically you're just a Regular everyday person. Yeah. I mean, Rod, Roddy Piper's huge. Yeah. <laughs> and well, Keith David, too. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. There was like a six minute fight scene. Oh, yeah. That alley <laughs> fight is ridiculous. It goes on for a minute. Yeah. I also love Buck Flowers as a uh, resident homeless man. Yes. Uh, yep. He's, oh my God. He's in like every Carpenter movie. Speaking it's great. Speaking of Wishmaster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also homeless man there. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah. He, he, John Carpenter basically, like, and it's obvious from the movie, They Live is not a subtle film, which is great. No. And it doesn't need to be. Um, but it's, he thinks America's biggest problem, its biggest vice is that we're so greedy and we have this winner mentality, if that sounds familiar. <laughs> but the idea of winning got to be a winner at everything yeah the doggy dog uh dog eat dog kind of mentality and just the idea of like the wealth you know that there's a certain layer of a, of a class basically that gets to control everything and then basically keeping workers in check to be aspiring for something that they'll never really attain because mm-hmm. it's the game's fixed right yeah. <laughs> like, like, there is no trick or down yeah. yeah it's the carrot that <laughs> We get dangled in front of us, yeah. But there um, is no trickle down economy. Yeah. 
So this is a quote from him. He says, I wanted to make some political statements, one of the biggest being that everybody is proud to be an American as long as they can make money at it. For the longest time, I wasn't quite sure how to tell this story. One way was to make it scary, but this element of humor always kept creeping into it. So, yeah, it is like there's some funny, you know, if it wasn't funny, it would be just overwhelmingly depressing. <laughs> like that means such a, a, a hard movie to get through, I think. Um, it's also based on a short story, 8 O'Clock in the Morning by mm-hmm. Ray Faraday Nelson. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep, yep. Um, so it premiered right before the election in 1988. <laughs> so it's a hit. But critics have mixed feelings, particularly because there's a seven minute long fight scene. <laughs> it is yeah. like insanely Yo, long. You cast a pro wrestler. I know. <laughs> Fucking do it. I guess that him and he met Rowdy Rowdy Piper at WrestleMania 3. Hell yeah. Which is, I would have loved. Why was John Carpenter at WrestleMania he liked, 3? He, I guess he's a wrestling, but he likes wrestling. Yes. There's yeah. such an overlap. Yeah. <laughs> this also is kind of a, a personal thing for him because it also factors into the idea that he could be making movies that do make more money but are mediocre. But he's like, and you know, what? I'm just going to keep doing what I want. They have recruited the rich and the powerful. They're running the whole show. Wake up. They're all about you. All around you. Let's see. Him and Adrian Bartbow divorced in 1988. Then he oh, takes no. like three years off. And 1990, he gets remarried to Sandy King who was his script supervisor. Okay. Was she a script supervisor during his marriage to Adrian Barbeau? I am not sure. (laughs) Do not know that. Didn't he have to make four films for Alive? we'll We'll get to that. Oh, okay. Or did I skip it on accident? Uh, oh, Wes Craven. There we go. I, I did see skip it. An accident. Wes, so after that, d- the divorce, and he's like, I need some time off. Wes Craven takes over that contract. Oh, oh that's cool. Well, that's Do you know what movies Wes Craven made? No, uh, I didn't it? put them down. Okay. I'm not sure. But this would have been before, maybe New Nightmare was the fourth. No, because that was New Line. So mm. that probably would have been before New Nightmare. So in 1990, he makes Memoirs of an Invisible Man starring Chevy Chase. We didn't watch this one. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds really fucking bad. Right? Because Chevy like, no. Chase is like, I want to be a serious actor because he was just in Dan Aykroyd's movie, uh, Nothing But Trouble, which like is a is like infamously terrible. Oh yeah, it's his, it's Dan Aykroyd's directorial debut and oh, is no. like one. It's just a very bad, infamously bad movie. So Chevy <laughs> Chase is like, I need to be a leading man in a serious film. And John Carpenter is looking at the script and is like, dude, this isn't really a serious film. It's and say. listen and listen. If you're not familiar, Chevy Chase is you, notoriously difficult to yeah. work with. Like I've heard that. Yeah. 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 And mm. like him and Dan Harmon on community who Dan Harmon is also notoriously difficult yeah. to work with. So like them two on the set of community when they were doing that show was yeah. just like, yo God. Yeah. So after this, this like this bombs mixed reviews. Meh. So it's uh, apparently this is the author's opinion, but probably the least John Carpenter, John Carpenter movie just has the least, you know, even less than Christine. I w- I think. Yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, apparently Sam Neill's a great villain in it though. Oh, so cool. That's cool. Oh, he is. He's in that. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Hmm. Um, no, so mad. I won't is ever it watch horror it. at all or no? <laughs> I don't think it is. No. Okay. Um, so 1993, he works on this. They made a pilot for this horror anthology called Body Bags that became John Carpenter Presents Body Bags. Mm. Apparently, he hated TV, <laughs> referring to it as, quote, talking furniture. Oh, my God. Um, but he <laughs> realizes, oh, wait, I can work in TV with a lot more freedom. So he does this pilot that's like a it's like shorts. Um, and he's also introducing segments for the show it's like a tales from the crypt oh. kind of thing where he's in this crazy makeup and stuff and is unzipping body bags and what? i know i was like i need to go watch that <laughs> that's pretty cool apparently you can you can get the the pilot which is the only thing they filmed um 1994 he makes in the mouth of madness which is a controversial film of his a misunderstood film of his this is like weird intellectual horror which is you start seeing that in prince of darkness Mm -hmm. but this is like i think he just fucking goes for it it's written by michael deluca who wrote freddy's dead which is kind of that blew my mind a little bit yeah freddy's dead sort of winked at the camera too it does yeah it's a tiny bit meta it's bad but it's uh, I actually watched that recently again for the like probably 10th time oh man I (laughs) i i don't hate it I like it. I, <laughs> it's, it's I don't know so if it's not my favorite. It. It's, it's not my favorite. I put it above part five, yeah. Dream Child, which I fucking hate. Really? But yeah, because Fre- like Dream Child bores the shit out of me. Freddy's dead, at least. I, don't, I like the ear part. 
Yeah, with the, Reese the dropping the pins part. and yeah. stuff. Yeah. I like that. That was sad. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it is sad. <laughs> um, but in the Mouth of Madness is a it's an homage to HP Lovecraft. It's like Lovecraftian, again, faceless evil, like forces bigger than you could possibly comprehend as a human, which that's hard to film, but uh <laughs> That's what's going on in that movie. It's a lot of fun. It's about an author who basically is supposed to be Stephen King, who sells books <laughs> yes. that make people violent or even crazy. And it, he said it's his commentary on the movement then of conservative politicians blaming horror for violence, which if you want to hear us talk more about, uh, listen to our Moral Panic episode, because we talk all about this this period in history. Hmm. And I will history. say it wasn't just conservative politicians. That's either. true. T- Tipper Gore. I was going to yeah. say Tipper Gore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what this book had. Yeah, but the yeah, 90s it were just full of all politicians blaming yeah, media for violence. I, I really think it it, mu- it might have been an across the aisle thing where people on both sides could be like, horror is ruining this country. Yeah, yeah. Or, and then video no. games, <laughs> Mortal Kombat. Yeah, you know? we can't let the Dems off Even the, the hook Simpsons? here. <laughs> yeah. Charleston Heston is in The Mouth of Mad- Madness, Isn't which that is weird? awesome. Yeah. When he walked, I was like, yes. Dude, have you seen uh, Omega Man? <laughs> yes. Oh, man. I fucking love Omega Man, dude. I loved, you know, the thing I liked about Omega, once again, like just for representation, there was a black woman as his uh, love interest. And she's actually a really popular actress. She was in a different world as the dean later on. And I was like, I wasn't expecting this. I was just like, this is awesome. Wait, whose love interest is she? Uh, <laughs> Charleston Heston. Yeah. It's, oh, okay. it's the, I, I could be wrong, but I believe it's the first interracial kiss on film. or On, on the big screen? Yes. Okay. I think. Because Star this, Trek bro? had 70s. one. Yeah, Star Trek, yeah. it was the first on TV. This yeah, that might have been. Yeah, oh, they did wow. a whole thing. And I was like, I was not expecting this. This is awesome. Dude, Omega <laughs> Man's a lot of fun. Actually, you know what? Thinking about because I was just I was just reading about uh Lucille Ball the other day for whatever reason, and I'm assuming her and Ricky kissed at some point. So like that was kind of interracial because like the he was Cuban. That's and, I was like back then, like sure, yeah, he yeah. was not a white yeah, person. They didn't, want, they didn't want a Cuban guy as her <laughs> no, husband. They no, not. they didn't. Just props to Lucy and Desi. All yep. right. Yeah. Basically, no one saw it, and critics didn't like it. And because you said bullshit, it, it's great. Kind of be uh, maybe because of New Nightmare. Yeah, coming out around New the Nightmare same time. came out like a week before or mm, something, and I, that might be part of it. That's is like also that's also meta. really meta. There are people's comments on my kill count of it who just don't get it. They're like, "Wait, but Nancy died." I'm oh like, my it's not god, Nancy, it's Heather. I know. That's weird. Okay, yeah. I mean, sometimes I feel like so. I have to stop when I'm like thinking of. I'm like, I got it, but then not everyone has the same kind of you know sensibilities or something yeah Yeah. then he also literally weeks after in the mouth of madness comes out because they pushed the release of in the mouth of madness so he also has this village of the damned remake come out (laughs) is that that the one with kirstie yeah yes christopher reeve mark hamill kirstie ellie and oh yeah mark that also is bad it's Mm -hmm. bad it does Mm -hmm. it does not do well um, I'm so yep. curious. Razzie for Razzie for worst remake of the year. Oh, I know. Won eh. it? Yeah, I mean the Razzies it, yeah. are bullshit. Anyway. They are bullshit. When did Children of the Corn come out? Because I felt like this had Children of the Corn by yeah. it was late 80s, yeah. I believe. Okay, that's probably also maybe yeah. played into that's it. Um, so <laughs> if you're if you're a Carpenter fan in 1996, you were like a little freaked out because he's had this string of kind of bombs you know so that's why he makes the choice to do a sequel to escape from new york and he does escape from la where america is actually the prison like it's not in the movie la la island is the prison but really it's america that's the prison okay so this is quote about it the united states of america has become a sort of right-wing christian fundamentalist country what they're doing in order to clean it up and keep it right-wing and keep people from exercising free speech free thought and having any kind of sexual freedom and all that kind of stuff is they deport anyone they deem to be bad and los angeles is the island where they deport them to so there's Mm. a woman who he meets who's muslim because that she got deported because she's muslim who's on LA oh, this Island. is the premise of the movie. They yeah, deport- yeah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And wait, but LA's not an. I island. guess in this, I don't know. I haven't seen it. Okay. I have not seen Escape from LA. But I guess the the plot with the Muslim woman was a nod to Pat Buchanan's 1992 Republican convention speech about Christians winning back their culture. Yes. I think he surfs through the streets of L.A., right? Really? Like, there's, like, a water scene. This is one of those other movies where I feel like I've seen it like, or whatever. Yeah, a, a I don't, ago. but I don't yeah. remember. So I'm, like, kind of on the fence of if I've seen it or if I've just, like, remember certain scenes. Yeah. They surf, and I also heard something about, like, botched plastic surgery happens. Oh. Like, there's, like, weird figures where they had botched plastic surgery going as a it. thing towards L.A. 
<laughs> yeah, 1997, he releases Vampires based on a novel. Um, I thought this was very interesting. When this was released in 1998, so you've got Wesley Snipes and Blade, which is like a similar premise to this vampire movie. When Vampires comes out, it also is competing against a Kurt Russell movie coming out at the same time, Halloween H2O, which hadn't, it came out a few months before this, but it was still in theaters. It was doing so also. He's also competing against Jamie Lee Curtis. And like his, and like the series that he Yes. Wow. He's competing against Bride of Chucky, which oh, there's a man. scene in the beginning where there is a Michael Myers mask and mm-hmm. homage. Urban Legend, which is a movie that doesn't exist without Scream, which doesn't exist without Halloween, and Practical Magic. Fuck th- fuck practical magic. I know. It wasn't good. Wasn't that put on at my sister's yes, wedding? Yes, it was bad. When, just Oh, fuck that movie. We, that was so I, bad. We had never seen it, and I was like, man, I hate this. Yeah, it and it was good. one of those movies where the whole family was together watching, so we had to just sit there and fucking yeah, watch it. Yeah, we can't, like, snark during it. I think we left. <laughs> I I thought, I, hey you know what but, congrats but Janelle. like this whole like this little like snapshot of this weekend is it shows how influential he's been mm-hmm. and how much of an impact he's had on the industry to the point where he's competing against himself and his legacy yeah. during this weekend um nonetheless it, it is the top film of that weekend oh. but it does fade fast uh, in the following weeks and it does not gross anywhere near what blade does which was like the competing film then he does Ghost from Mars in 2001. I've never seen this. It began apparently as Escape from Mars, the third film in the yeah. Escape trilogy, oh, which, God, I would love to see that. Um, but it was changed to original story and characters because the studio wanted Ice Cube, damn it. They want Ice Cube to lead a picture. So Ice Cube is the lead of Ghost, from Mar- or Ghost of Mars. I kind of really want to watch this. My brother owns that movie. Yeah. yeah. But it's because it's Ice Cube. And yeah. I think we're already just like, well, we got to support this. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen it? I have. It- I, I thought, you know, I don't know. I thought <laughs> it had some interesting concepts when it came to like the ghost of like what they were doing, like affecting the people and stuff. Um, yeah, what's the premise of this movie? Like, well, he's like an escape, not escape con, but she's supposed to, the main actress, uh, main character, she's supposed to like, uh, take him from one spot to another she's investigating something it's real hazy like she's investigating (laughs) something and the the people are on mars now but something escapes some type of entity escapes and they're really like disembodied spirits of old martians and stuff who still think that they're under attack and they like possess the people (laughs) Uh to like kill each other and self-mutilate and stuff like that so you know, her, Ice Cube, and others have to try to figure out to save humanity so they don't affect all of humanity. So wow. I kind of really want to I mean, watch it's this. a cool, and when you think of some of the stuff he writes, it's like, it's, yeah, it's a cool concept, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I was like, okay, that's an interesting that concept. I, I, you know what? I'd watch it. Um, around this time, he does two episodes for Masters of Horror. Yeah. Shout out Mick Garris, friend of the watched, pod. Uh, I'll say friend of the pod. Sure. <laughs> I've interviewed him. Yeah, he's like the nicest. Everyone, yeah, so yeah. Masters of Horror, I mean, we mentioned earlier that he had a pilot of a show that sounded similar yes. to this. It's like uh, each episode yeah. is, yeah, it's anthological. Each episode is directed by someone else who's telling their own yeah, horror story. Yeah, and Masters story. of Horror is so cool because each yeah, episode dude. is directed by a master mm-hmm. of horror. Yeah. So like you've got Toby, Toby Hooper, Hooper Joe Dante. Usna. Yeah, just it's everyone. It's fucking awesome. But Cigarette Burns is like, I think... A, a lot of people consider it the best episode of the series. I love Cigarette Burns. I, I watched it in college. We just watched it last I night. I made James watch it again with me last night because I was like, you haven't seen it. It's only it's an hour. It's real cool, dude. It's very, very cool. Um, Just go seek it. I won't like spoil it. But that also is like a cerebral, like we're getting weird in that one. Mm-hmm. I feel like you would like it. Okay. It it's... reminds me of, because what's the one with the book? Oh, Ma- Mouth Madness. Madness. Yeah, it, when I heard that it was like a book, I was like, "Oh, that's kind of like cigarette." There's definitely oh, okay. similar. Yeah, I think you would like it for sure. And yeah, it's nice. It's only an hour, just like nice and short and sweet. It's very good. 2010. I've never seen this. He does The Ward. Is that the last movie he's directed? Yes. 2010, nine years ago. Yeah, bad reviews. Does not do well. Lots Damn, of critics man. feel he's holding on too hard to old style. Doesn't and- it have who's in that one? Amber Heard. Amber Heard, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Also, Danielle Pan- Panna Becker. Sorry, she's from oh. The Flash. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she's also in it. Okay. <laughs> Playing oh, against type, uh, I feel the chick like. chick from the Friday the 13th remake? Yes. Okay. Which I actually like that. The pseudo one. final girl? I like yeah. the Friday remake, yeah. too. I thought it was good. Except for, I mean, the characters kind of suck, but whatever. It's a Friday <laughs> movie. 
Oh, so, wait, what's this quote at the end? Can I read this? Yes, please. I love this quote of his. This kind of really sums up like where, uh-huh. I don't know when this is from, but I just think it's such an iconic quote. I'll tell you what I am. It depends on what country I'm in. In France, I'm an auteur. In England, I'm a horror movie director. In Germany, I'm a filmmaker. In the U.S., I'm a bum. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Grumpy old man, John Carpenter. Carpenter's got love some him. critiques of America. Oh, man, he's got some <laughs> awesome. sass. I love it, <laughs> I know, yeah. I love it. Definitely, if you want more, like, just John Carpenter talking about stuff, Check out that Nightmares in Red, White, and Blue, which I used as a source on our Zombies episode, I the, think. Is but it a book, right? No, the it's book? a documentary. Oh, okay. Or a document, like a, yeah, no, it's a documentary. Um, You can watch it on Amazon, I think, if you have Amazon Prime. But he does a lot of interviews in that. And yeah, he has, he has things to say about America. Um, I think he's in Eli Roth's History of Horror. Oh, okay. Getting interviewed, doing some yes, stuff, I, I think. Yes, I think he was. I mean, uh, everyone was in that episode. thing and then uh, you should read chauncey's thing on they live yes too. i'll link to that in the description because it's a very good article and gets more into that movie like than we could do what, here. what site was that written for uh people's world okay dot org cool cool oh my god the nice dot org i always feel legit when i have my little sources <laughs> section i have a bunch of dot orgs i'm like yeah i used good <laughs> sources this week <laughs> cool yeah it's it's a really yeah it's a great article um cool i think definitely follow chauncey too if you want more you do a lot of good analysis of horror and aren't afraid to get into like social analysis and yeah. critique, which i'm always a big fan of thank you yeah what's your twitter uh miss chauncey kr okay yeah. and then your your youtube's like your main yeah my main one youtube my youtube channel self name chauncey k robinson twisted girl next door yeah cool cool we'll yeah, link link. all that yeah uh, are you still doing your crazy release schedule that you mentioned? Yeah, I do about um, I don't know. It's crazy. It's like what, like three to four videos a week. A week. Yeah, that's crazy. That's, so crazy. <laughs> that's fucking crazy. But if you are like, when's the next Demi video? You know, really, like, you know what? Chauncey will like keep you happy. Yeah, she's got you covered. <laughs> Serious. Thank you. Yeah, for real. And yeah, if you're a patron or thinking about being a patron, Chauncey joined us for one of the commentary tracks. Which the three dollar and up patrons get. We watch yeah. most likely to die. Yes, that was oh, yeah. you did. <laughs> <laughs> it did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Better movie than I thought it was gonna be. It was. Slightly, yeah. But I didn't have high standards there for that. All. Was, oh yeah. Perez Hilton is in it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yup. <laughs> uh, this was our longest podcast. I episode. think you are. Yeah, you were here for the long. Congratulations. Yeah, nice marathon. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, that was a long one. That was, it was a beefy a lot of fun one. To go through it. I'm sad I wasn't. Uh, I had I haven't seen as many as you guys but i want to watch them mm-hmm. we'll definitely watch in the mouth of madness because that's mm-hmm. the one that oh me and chauncey God, were so like awesome. oh. did you say that was your favorite that's my favorite okay then yeah yeah yeah. it, we'll it rules pretty that. hard it's <laughs> very cool yeah cool Great, social yeah. meets sure yeah follow dead meat on social media at dead meat james that's on twitter and instagram there's also a subreddit a discord and i'm on twitch dead meat james I think it's Dead Meat James. Just look for me on Twitch. There's so much shit to keep track of. I am at Carevec, C-R-E-V-E-C-C on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch, tell me Uh We already said Chauncey's socials. Yep. Anything else to plug for you no, that you want? that. Okay. <laughs> cool. Simple enough. Perfect. Uh, we'll be back next week, I think, with a movie with review. With a review. If, uh, if, <laughs> if Chelsea can recover from the editing this yeah. one's going to take. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, until next time. Why is that? I don't know. Why is that weird? That's kind of weird. All right. I hope we didn't lose this whole episode. Hope we didn't lose this whole episode. Until <laughs> next time, I'm James. Oh, no. I'm and this is Chauncey, and this has been the Debbie Podcast. <laughs>